So let's get started with our first panel, which will be taking a look at happiness in youth and young adults. Our first panelist is Jan Denev, uh, Professor of Economics and Director of Wellbeing Research Center at the University of Oxford. He is also an editor of the World Happiness Report and co-founder of the World Wellbeing Movement. Dr. Nevad, thank you for joining us today. Um, can you all hear me? Perfect. Um, so. Well, first of all, thank you for the kind invitation, but especially uh, I want to applaud uh, uh, Speaker Emeritus Rendon and members of the committee for, first of all, setting up his committee um, and putting a focus on well-being and how well-being metrics can perhaps be put at the heart of public policy. Um, the United States is lagging on this front relative to some other countries, uh, and it's wonderful and heartening to see uh, this pioneering example of this committee, which will then hopefully inspire uh, uh, other states and who knows, even the federal government. Um, if, I, if we can have the next slide, please. Um, in the space of a handful of minutes, what I'm hoping to do is to, uh, first of all, remind us of, of how we very briefly define well-being and how we measure it, which will then underpin also the data, the descriptive data I'll be sharing around um, California that we've done for you, uh, which will be building on uh, uh, Gallup surveys that were done and a very rich data set indeed. And then finally conclude with uh, recent trends in youth well-being as we've reported on them uh, in the World Happiness Report and deep dive a little bit for you today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so first of all, what is well-being? Well, it is certainly not a new concept. Happiness, well-being, and what constitutes a good life is something that is very old indeed. Uh, the first formal studies were probably Aristotle, well over 2,000 years ago, and philosophers ever since have been debating this summum bonum, the ultimate good, as it's often called. Um, I think one definition that we can probably rely on, for, especially for policy purposes, is it's ultimately how, about how we are doing as individuals and communities, and critically, how that makes us feel about the way our lives are going. So in essence, it's quality of life as people experience it. Um, what's really exciting is that in the last two decades, so well since uh, Aristotle or even uh, the pursuit of happiness uh, and the Declaration of Independence, there's now an abundance and explosion of data around the data over the last two or three decades have developed an entire empirical science of well-being. So I again applaud all of you because your time might be the right time to start thinking about this properly because we could well be the right time to start thinking about these well-being metrics and applying well-being science to policy. The outcome that the founders and many others have ultimately envisioned as the KPI, if you will, for policymakers or its North Star. And it goes without saying that all policy areas, whether it's schooling, education, mobility, policing, you name it, all of these traditional domains ultimately feed into quality of life as people experience it. So uh, these data that you're about to see serve this purpose of a North Star, uh, a KPI for policy very well, I think. So thank you. Um, how do we measure well-being? Well, there's no way around it. Ultimately, you do have to ask people whether their lives are good. And that's exactly what we do. In the World Happiness Report, and also the data you're about to see, rely on all one single question. And it's something very basic. We call it our workhorse. It's essentially life satisfaction or satisfaction with life uh, as people rate it on a scale from zero to 10. In particular, the data you're about to see for um, California rely on a variant, which is called the Cantor letter of life uh, for the aficionados in the room. It's essentially asking, imagine a letter where the best possible life for you is a 10 and the, the worst possible life is a zero. Where do you think you stand today? It's essentially life satisfaction or life evaluations on a scale from zero to 10. Thank you. Um, what you're seeing on the screen right now is the actual distribution to that answer, uh, sorry, the answer, the distribution of the answers to that question uh, posed by uh, Gallup as part of the uh, US poll or known in academic world as a daily poll um, for over 215,000 uh, Californians. Um, this is your distribution. So while the average is sort of 7.9, sorry, 7.09 out of 10, which is slightly above the US average, the average hides a wide distribution. So yes, there's about 20% uh, of people who will rate their quality of lives eight or eight, uh, sorry, nine or 10. There will also be about 20% of people who rate the quality of their lives as five, four, three, two, one, zero out of 10. Um, when we dig into who sits within these, this long tail of ill-being, unhappiness, it's mostly mental health concerns, abject poverty, and those kind of uh, situations. Um, that obviously uh, need much more uh, attention. If you can just go back to the slide I was on. 
Um, I do want to point out that the Gallup data of the US poll is likely the, um, uh, as far as I can tell, the richest data set, but it, is, it did stop in 2018. There are more recent data sets. They're less rich in nature, so they don't allow the slicing and dicing and the mapping that you're about to see. Um, but every indication is that the average well-being in California today will be slightly lower and probably just below 7 out of 10 uh, as the U.S. as a whole has moved in that direction. So one obvious uh, recommendation to this committee that I'm hoping will be taken on or uh, an output would be to invest in <coughs> metrics of well-being um, and uh, it sort of speaks for itself. Um, and that can be done as part of official statistics or by partnering with uh, Gallup, for example, and building on their wonderful data. Um, what you're seeing now is not just the distribution, but the distribution spread around California as measured by county. So I think, and I hope this is exciting to you because you know these places better than anyone. What you're seeing here is the um, geographical mapping and the average level of well-being per county mapped by that, in that heat map with darker colors being higher levels of life satisfaction and lighter less. Um, first thing to note is there's a lot of variation between counties in California. Um, and it runs from 6.5 to 7.9. Um, just uh, as a point of reference, the uh, happiest county in California would essentially sit at the very top of the World Happiness Report next to Finland and Denmark, whereas the lowest well-being county would be placed 30 or 35th. Uh, so huge variation within the state of California, but you'll see there's also variation within cities. Um, if I can go to the next slide, please. Um, here is, uh, if you can read, and I'm happy to, to share and distribute, is the actual ranking, if you will, a World Happiness Report for California alone, where um, the one caveat to note is that Alpine County needs to be discounted uh, because uh, there were only 12 respondents. It's a very sparsely populated uh, place, uh, but the 12 respondents do seem to be very happy. Uh, but if you take that out of uh, contest, then you find essentially Marin County at the very top and a, a number of the others that you would probably expect it to be there as well, uh, and likewise at the bottom. So this begs the question, okay, so quality of life as people experience it around these counties is very different. Why might that be the case? And you can probably think of a number of good reasons why that are all policy relevant. So again, if I may emphasize, what you're seeing here is essentially the number that should be your KPI or North Star, and then reverse engineer from there to see which departments need to kick into action, whether it's housing, health, education, mobility, et cetera, that could be driving up the overall quality of life. So this is why this committee is so important. Next slide, please. For the aficionados in the room, and really because I have to, is while our workhorse is life satisfaction, um, really, you could also measure uh, well-being through actual affective measures, like happiness, the, the, the title of this committee, uh, or enjoyment, or also the absence of or experience of negative emotions like stress and worry. And I'll show you some data on that later on. What's nice for us is there's a robustness here, just sort of external validity in the sense that the map is very similar, uh, whether you're looking at life evaluations or affective measures. So, for example, in Marin County, you will also experience most, you'll see people experience most positive emotions. Uh, and vice versa, obviously, on the negative emotion side. <coughs> Next slide, please. Uh, thanks to a partnership uh, between Blue Zones and Gallup, uh, we've been able to work and analyze data at the zip code level. So I've just shown off the data at county level. We can dig deeper. Thanks to Gallup's richness uh, and vastness of the data that they've compiled, it allows us to dig deeper. What you're seeing here is San Jose City by zip code, and somewhat surprisingly, perhaps to most, um, is that the um, well-being inequalities you're seeing there are as vast as you have across the entire state. So within a space like San Jose, and it's not just uh, limited to San Jose, you'll see it in other major cities as well, you'll see differences of more than a point on a scale from zero to 10, which is a lot. Um, so here again, you'll see sort of six and a half to seven and a half uh, average life satisfaction between zip codes with the inner city, lower happy, uh, less happy, and the uh, leafy, more wealthy suburbs uh, on the higher end of life satisfaction. So these data can really serve uh, and inform evidence-based policy making at city level, at state level, at federal level. And if the, this, if the data is rich enough, you can really work on even uh, geographical um, uh, pain points even, if you will. Um, all right, next slide, please. Um, on to the, the, the final uh, element of uh, the presentation, I think really the topic uh, of today, and I hope that this will then also help introduce the other experts uh, that will join us uh, uh, today. Um, as uh, the World Happiness Report in its 12th uh, edition focused in on uh, age cohorts. 
And in particular, uh, the team, my team at Oxford and myself, we worked on youth and adolescent well-being, tried to get the best data out there on it. First of all, you should note there's very little data on youth and adolescents. Um, most of the data sets start 18 plus, including the general US General Social Survey and others. So there's a lack of data, um, but whatever data we did have, it, it wasn't looking pretty. And so uh, the US got a starring role in this year's World Happiness Report for bad reasons. It's because it's really the youth in America that is off a cliff and that's driven down the overall ranking of the United States in terms of well-being in a global context. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, thank you. Um, so what you're seeing here, so the first time what we've done is uh, looking at the best places to live uh, in terms of the experience of quality of life, people uh, tell us, um, but split by age. And so here, the best places to live if you're below 30 um, uh, are not in the United States, I'm afraid. It's uh, the US uh, has dropped to place 62nd, uh, I think between Peru and Guatemala, uh, if you look at uh, average life satisfaction um, below, uh, below 30. Now, if you, um, that, is not a, that is not a universal trend in the United States, because if you look, for example, at, the, at people age 60 and above, the US still very, very much ranks high. The US is, is very much at the top, in fact, is number 10 uh, in terms of life satisfaction when you consider people that are 60 and above. And so it's really interesting to see that I've shown you distributional heterogeneity, I've shown you uh, geographical disparities, but there is also an intergenerational disparity growing in the United States. Um, next slide, please. If we look just at the California data, which is these uh, um, 215,000 plus survey respondents that we have data uh, uh, survey responses from thanks to Gallup, uh, and we then split them by age cohorts, um, what you find is what you're seeing on the screen. And um, this may not strike uh, normal people as odd, but it certainly does experts, uh, and that is because normally you'd expect a U-shape. So around the world, one of the most, uh, 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 most robust replicated studies in terms of well-being science is a traditional U-shape relationship between age and well-being. Well, that U-shape, the first leg of it at least, has disappeared in the context of North America, uh, and you can tell it in the California data as well. Uh, not only has it disappeared, but I think you're going to be hearing uh, from my colleague Danny Blanchflower, who's, done more, who has more, who's worked on more recent data. I think at this point, the first two bars that you're seeing there are actually below uh, the midlife crisis. So it's not that youth are experiencing midlife crisis today, they're below uh, uh, the, the midlife uh, point at this point. And so it's a very awkward situation. And as you'll see on the next slide, it's a gradual decline that's been happening for over a decade and a half where all Americans have seen a gradual decline, but youth have started declining at an, at an accelerating pace. And so really around 2016-17, what is academically speaking very odd, is that crossover where youth now start lower than adults. So people um, above 25 uh, are uh, happier than people below 25, and that is not meant to be uh, from historical data. And this is awkward and obviously begs explanation and action. Next slide, please. Um, to provide some more uh, context to this trend, and I think it is important to know that what you're seeing in the United States is not necessarily a universal given. It could also be seen as a hopeful message there. In the sense that, yes, in Western Europe and Britain, you also see a gradual decline in youth well-being, although less, less fast, less accelerated. But you see other places around the world, and in particular Central and Eastern Europe, where it's been going up. But important to remember, of course, they start from much lower. So essentially, this is a global convergence, if you will, in youth well-being. But strikingly, this year and the past, American youth is lower than is uh, Western Europe or even Central and Eastern European youth. And that is likely to continue unless something happens. Next slide. Uh, if we look at it from different angles of well-being, just to make sure that what we're showing is not just limited to life satisfaction, I'll, I'm showing you now worry, um, which has, no pun intended, a worrying trend in that North America the level of worry now rises to, uh, I think, well over 50, uh, around 50% of youth being worried on a day-to-day -day basis. That has, trend has been increasing and increasing at a faster pace than elsewhere in the world. Next slide. If you look at stress, even more worryingly perhaps, has been rising even faster and is now at even higher levels uh, for youth in America than it is uh, elsewhere and relatively speaking to the past. Uh, next slide. 
If you look at sadness, which is particularly sad, is that now youth in America, about 20 or 30 percent, if I read correctly from a distance, I think it's 30 percent, now feel sad on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, a big increase over the last three, four years, uh, picked up in part uh, by, or exacerbated in part by COVID, but people haven't come back to the levels they were before COVID, unlike in other places around the world. Finally, Rested yesterday is a measure of, if you will, um, more physical well-being and an indicator or a proxy for it. Uh, and what you see here is particularly disturbing, which is why I really wanted to include it. Uh, it might link to social media, which is um, unlike other places, Western Europe and Central and Eastern Europe, you see that um, only uh, in 50% of cases, youth describe themselves as, um, uh, as essentially fatigued, not rested. Um, um, and that is particularly disturbing as well because that has no immediate health consequences. Next slide. So all of these things matter in and of themselves because well-being is an ultimate outcome. So the fact that they're feeling unhappy is something that needs action. But for people that are more instrumentalist in nature, it also matters because um, a decline in well-being amongst youth or generally has behavioral outcomes as a result. And we have a lot of evidence on this front uh, around these uh, con downstream consequences, and they have to do with health and longevity. They have to do with, say, financial decision-making. They have to do with pro-social behaviors. And on the next slide, please, I'm showing you one study, and I'll conclude with that, where we also show that, a low, that levels of well-being, whether measured through life satisfaction or affective measures, are predictive of later labor market outcomes and even income. In other words, productivity is measured through income. Um, next slide, please. This study was very well received in academia, uh, was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and is uh, um, a study that essentially shows using 15,000 American youth, part of the National Longitudinal, National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent Health, run out of UNC Chapel Hill. What you're seeing here is a panel study where we have youth's well-being at say, in this case, 19 or 20 or 22 years of age, and then their earnings of the same youth about a decade later, so a classic panel study where we follow and track people over time. What you're seeing here is that low levels of well-being uh, or variation of well-being at age 20, late adolescence, is highly predictive of their earnings, if you will, labor market outcomes and productivity, about a decade later. This is in the thousands and thousands of dollars. Despite this being a very old study, the data is about 15 years old, if not more, um, and what you're seeing here is already about $10,000, $12,000 difference in terms of predictive power. Now, and I'll finish on this, striking and relevant to the declining trend in well-being for youth, the effect is mostly driven by ill-being. So it's people that are not feeling good as youth and, and adolescents, they are the ones who end up doing the worst uh, uh, later on in terms of their later earnings and uh, obviously as a proxy for labor market outcomes. So this is very powerful and it shows that there are uh, real economic consequences to a reduction in well-being and all the more alarm bells going off and, and calls for action. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm gonna ask my colleagues, I ask them first, I ask my colleagues if they have any questions. <laughs> Do you, I know you mentioned in on one of the slides um, that you could look for like where housing needs are and things like that. Are there studies that kind of help with the overlap of happiness levels, income levels, housing insecurity, food insecurity, all of the things that add to the stress of life? Absolutely. It's a really good question and an essential one to then actually drive policy based off these data. So, for example, your state official statistics, but especially this rich Gallup survey, they didn't just ask the license action question of these 215,000 Californians. They asked about 30, 40, 50 other questions that relate to housing, income, uh, um, and a whole host of other things that could be that are really part and parcel of the different traditional um, uh, policy areas. So, yes, essentially, you start from asking people how they feel about their life. Mm -hmm and then look uh, for differences or what might help explain differences by looking at traditional policy levers, whether it's housing, mobility, education, health, et cetera. And so the data are there. Uh, and so in partnership with Blue Zones, we've actually done this for San Jose City and a few other places. And then you see what tends to explain variation in a place like San Jose, health and health, health status. So do you feel like your health is in a good place? 
for your age level, or it could be um, housing, access to housing, quality housing, and are you proud of the community you're part of? So these kind of elements start playing a big role in explaining variation between uh, life satisfaction. So what's really nice is we essentially start from asking people whether they're happy, and then try and reverse engineer, put the science to work, and make it relevant to policy and policy actionable. And what are um, some of the, you know, those I think can be seen as more adult type issues. Um, what are some of the trends in terms of what seem to be causing this for youth or younger people? So people will immediately start thinking of social media, smartphones, but I think it's important to know that as you saw from the World Happiness Report data, there's a gradual, there's a gradual decline for all of Americans. So that's driven by polarization, income inequalities, difficulty with access to healthcare, et cetera, housing, the usual. But you also see an acceleration of the drop for youth. So in addition to the aforementioned, I think for youth, you now also have student debt, insecurity or uncertainty about the future labor market. For, for example, if I were to now have to choose my studies, it's very worrying in the sense that chat GPT may well have caught up in two or three years and my skill set might well be um, obsolete by the time I finish school. Mm -hmm. And then there is indeed social media, something that youth take a lot more part in. Had the great privilege of interacting with um, the US Surgeon General recently. He noted that on average, youth now spent four and a half hours a day on social media. From what you've seen from distribution, that's the average. That probably hides people from almost nothing to maybe six, seven, eight, nine hours. Mm -hmm probably plays into the fatigue as well. So social media certainly does have an important role to play. I know my uh, colleagues, uh, and in particular Jonathan Haid with The Anxious Generation, uh, that book is obviously doing very well. Um, so there's definitely something about that acceleration that might have something to do with or correlated with social media. But I also want to push back a little bit on the more draconian type of interventions that somebody like Jonathan Haidt is, is suggesting, because they would suggest no social media below 16, mm -hmm. no smartphones on the school, uh, school, et cetera. I think there might be ways of harnessing so social media in a way that one puts the social back into social media by harnessing these algorithms to nudge towards actual social connections and people that you actually have that are in your vicinity and environment and then connect social, on social media also with those people that are social. The other thing that I think would be really important to look at in terms of social media, a sort of an intermediate step, is essentially go against doom scrolling, as kids would call it. And so for example, the all algorithms are designed to, before you even have the, the fastness of pace to swap to something else, they already feed you with a different video. So clearly there might be ways of putting guardrails in place where after the hundredth video that you've watched, you're being asked, do you really want to still continue? Uh, or, and if so, yes, by all means, but if not, no. So giving kids an opportunity to get off mm -hmm. of the otherwise very cleverly designed algorithms. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's important. So I think there's intermediate steps that are in collaboration with social media providers before maybe the more draconian interventions need to take place. Um, Vivek Murthy, the US Surgeon General, made an extraordinary an analogy here. Social media is here to stay. It's a bit like cars when they were introduced. When cars were introduced, there were no airbags, there were no seatbelts. And it's a bit the same right now with social media. Mm -hmm. So it's about working with these companies and making sure the right guardrails are in place. At the moment, it's a bit like driving without seatbelts mm -hmm. and airbags. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, and apologies, I, I arrived a little late, if so if I missed this. Um, it, does your data, is, is, is are we seeing like the effects of COVID on youth and is this part of, or, or a factor, um, the isolation, um, maybe a higher level of anxiety in children or kids that never had this before? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, and so first of all, the gradual decline in well-being for Americans more generally and for youth predates COVID. So it's very clear that we're talking 2015, 16, 17, when the acceleration decline started. Now, it, this is exacerbated by COVID, but strikingly, as you will have seen in some of the graphs, it hasn't recovered, not even half, uh, to where it was uh, pre-COVID in, 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 in American context. So for example, rested yesterday, the fatigue question, or the one around sadness and worry, you see is nowhere near where it was uh, at the start of COVID. So it has exacerbated a certain decline, and people, youth especially, have not recovered from it. And, and I feel, you know, when you think about youth not feeling rested, I feel like, um, I think back about my own children, they were very busy, and I'm 
sometimes even wondering if maybe I overscheduled them with mm -hmm. things that they wanted to do. And I wonder if, you know, parents being busier, mm -hmm. uh, being able to work from home at night, it just maybe, you know, not as much social interaction as a family union because everybody's so busy. If that's a small component. It's, it's a very good uh, observation and I should have perhaps added into the mix. So while there's a number of general causes, perhaps for why there's a gradual decline for Americans, for youth, there's a number of additional elements, student debt, um, uncertainty by the future, social media. The one I should have added is exactly the one you're highlighting, is there's perhaps also more expectations uh, of, on them than there are for others. That being said, as you highlight yourself, it might be an element, maybe not the, not the most important, but certainly one that matters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple questions before we go to our next panelists. Uh, you talked about investing in metrics. The, the, yeah. the state doing that. What what does that look like? What what, what should we be doing? Well, it's uh, very simple. Um, either in partnership with Gallup or another provider, but Gallup has um, certainly the most uh, credibility on this front and the most historical data, or as part of your official statistics, which I'm sure you have, just like in the United Kingdom, we've got the Office for National Statistics. It would be virtually costless to, at the very least, integrate the overarch the workhorse in the field of well-being science, which would be, on a scale from zero to 10, how sad are you with your life these days? and make that a more of um, a KPI alongside GDP or income or whatever is typically used. Um, so that would be virtually costless um, um, and should be in there. Um, you have nationally a number of data sets, the US General Social Survey, but that's just a US representative survey that's really small, only happens once a year, and has the life satisfaction question, but it's only a few thousand Americans on a yearly basis. So it's good for US statistics generally compared to the rest of the world, but wouldn't do anything for you in terms of underpinning policy in the state of California. Um, so there is, I think, um, there's one other uh, by the CDC. There's the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, BRFS as we call it, uh, B-R-F-S-S. And they have also a large sample, and but they now have, in 2022, they now have also measured life satisfaction across the United States. So there might be uh, data for, provided they give you sort of uh, location elements in the data, there might be data for California in there too. But again, I would own up to it. So for me, it's clear the most obvious outcome of this committee would first and foremost be measure what you treasure, because what you measure then ultimately gets treasured. And so um, that would be, I think, an obvious outcome of this committee is to make sure that's part of the official Office for National Statistics that you have here, that it, that, that it gets in either outsourced or uh, in-house. Um, just, just for your information, the UK Office for National Statistics, since 2012, David Cameron uh, uh, put that to work. They've got four items, that they call the, uh, which we call the ONS4. But one is life satisfaction, you will have guessed it. Then also measure of, um, how happy were you yesterday, which is well, what you can do. The reason, by the way, why we say, talk about yesterday is to try and get rid of the, the day effect, the morning, midday, uh, evening effect. Uh, they also ask about worry. And they ask about purpose. Do you, or actually, to be more precise, do you find life worthwhile? And so it's those four items. So those capture your evaluative well-being, life satisfaction. It measures affective well-being, happiness and worry. And it measures Aristotle's eudaimonic well-being, finding life worthwhile, purpose and meaning. And those, are, those four together would be brilliant. So the OECD actually pushes this to all of your statistical agencies. At, but this would be coming in, that recommendation would be coming at the federal level, not the state level. So my recommendation to you would be very simple, essentially co-opt the ONS4 supported by, which the OECD also uh, promotes, and make sure that gets part of the national statistics, and then things will flow from there. Helpful. Uh, well, one last question, and I know you're a social scientist and you deal with data and sample sizes and all those types of things, but just, so I hate to ask you an anecdotal question. Um, but on the walk over here, you talked about, you teach at Oxford, uh, but you've been at UCLA and living in Venice for the past uh, term. Um, what, what have you seen? What observations have you had of sort of American life uh, that, that have an impact on, maybe are reflected in the data? Sorry. Yeah, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, there's one that stands out. There's the obvious ones that you can talk about in the American context, I'm, I'm sorry to say, which is obviously healthcare, health access. Um, this morning, the Uber ride across to the LAX airport, 
um, lady was unhappy in her job, had to stay because otherwise she'd be out of, um, out, of, uh, out of healthcare. So those are your traditional ones. Um, in income inequality is huge, especially in the context of LA. Uh, racial segregation, huge, also something I've observed. But the thing that I think you may not have been thinking of is sort of um, social capital, trust. Um, I find that when you drive around here with every uh, marketing advertisement is about had an accident, call my lawyer. Um, and so that element of essentially undermining trust means that if you interact with other people, the slightest thing that could go wrong, it could end up in a quagmire and in the, in the, end, the end of life as you, as, 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 you, as you know it. And so that, I think, is starting to, that legalistic element to it, which you have much less in continental Europe, especially, especially you know, let alone in Latin America and other places, that, I think, has slowly been eroding the social capital you've got in society. So measures around um, uh, social support, uh, trusting each other, trusting in institutions, that has been eroding. And I think it's, it's hard to put your fingers on this, but I think you all feel it. The polarization is an element of it. But I sense that when interacting with people or when I see people interacting, that they're sort of like each to his own type element. And that is really a sorry state of affairs, especially because, and I'm happy to finish on this, the World Happiness Report shows very clearly over and over again, yes, GDP per capita matters in explaining variation of well-being across the world. Yes, healthy life expectancy matters. But the third big thing up there with the first two is social support. Do you have friends to rely on? Um, do you give? Do you volunteer? Do you trust others and do you trust the state? And we mentioned right at the end of the press briefing, and again, we'll finish on this, there's a very quirky little um, study that's been replicated over and over in social sciences, which captures this better than anything else. It's called the wallet drop experiment. You may or may not have heard of it. It's essentially an actual experiment and also one that's done uh, in a sort of a, in a, in a virtual sense, but the actual experiment is dropping wallets with money and ID cards somewhere and then seeing how many out of 100 actually come back. And it's a wonderful proxy to get a sense for do people believe and trust each other and do they trust the state, in this case often police officers, to actually then also return the wallet to the rightful owner. And what you're finding is there's almost a one-for-one -one match between the country ranking in the World Happiness Report, which is based off of these life satisfactions, and essentially the degree to which there's that sort of social trust, that social capital in society, that when a wallet gets lost, people are keen and eager to return it and believe that the police officer will actually do it. So that, that social support, like that is so precious, it's easy to lose, hard to regain. And that I sense, having did, done a big chunk of my grad studies uh, on the East Coast of the United States, there's less of it today than there was 15, 20 years ago when I did my grad studies. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. And also, you know, I've been uh, admiring your work for a, a long time. Uh, so I really appreciate you being here. Thank you and all you do. Thank you, Speaker Randall.